Okay, so um, I was asked to give a brief talk on uh, uh, the physics of radiation, different types of radiation, protons, neutrons, electrons, et cetera. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist here at the Swedish Cancer Institute. I've been here 12 years. Um, I began, and this is our center here. I think you recognize the four docs that work now. Um, when, I, when I began, I was at Northwest Hospital, which, where the Gamma Knife Center um, was based. And then uh, Bob and Sandy, Bob Meyer, Sandy Vermeulen have been here since the opening of the CyberKnife Center in 2006. Uh, Lloyd Zell came on about eight years ago. So, so let's start and talk a little bit about radiation and how it works. Um, this, all, all radiation essentially uh, affects tumor cells and normal cells by causing double strand breaks. That's the lethal mechanism. Uh, single strand breaks can also, uh, if they're close in proximity, they can cause cell death because essentially the DNA can't repair that. But if single strand breaks occur over wide range, they can be repaired. You can create a double strand break by having ionizing radiation, which is on the far left there. Do I have a laser? It's probably... um, you can create other modifications by having reactive oxygen species over there on the, on the right, uh, which can be any kind of free radical. So there's a lot in this slide. Um, the, uh, when you have, well, first of all, when you have a photon, uh, it, it enters into the body. It will hit a molecule, and there's two options. If it hits a DNA directly, it will create a secondary electron, and that electron can break the DNA. Um, the other option is that it can hit a water molecule, since there's a lot of water molecules around. And that will then, if it's in very close proximity to the DNA, that will create an oxygen-free radical for, uh, for a few nanoseconds, and that will then uh, damage the DNA. Um, in a, with a typical photon like we use in gamma knife or cyber knife, about two-thirds of the time you have the indirect effect, and about one-third of the time you have the direct effect. Um, the, this is important because the, uh, if you use different types of radiation, you, this is skewed. If you use something like a neutron, which is very high density, uh, mass, it will create more direct effect and has very little of the indirect effect um, versus, and protons is actually fairly similar to photons in that respect biologically. Um, the, it, you can repair the indirect effect, but you can't really repair, repair the, the direct effect uh, damage because it's a double strand break. The other thing is that oxygen is a radio sensitizer, so free radicals, the more free radicals that you create, the more damage it is done. So tumor cells that are hypoxic tend not to respond as well to radiation, which is one of the reasons actually when you're treating somebody, if they're anemic, often will transfuse them to get their crit above 30 um, because there's a feeling that if they're hypoxic, they won't respond. Okay, so let's look at different kinds of radiation. So the easiest to knock off is electrons. So on the left there in blue, you can see an electron dose uh, curve. On the bottom, you have the um, depth of, of, of tissue, and on the um, y-axis, you have the relative dose. So electrons don't penetrate very deep. They give all their energy within a few centimeters. We use them often. We use them uh, for inflammatory breast cancer, for skin cancers, things that are close to the surface. They're very easy to make. You basically have a, a, a X-ray, or you have a, a, a tube with high voltage on either side, and then you can essentially accelerate the electron and then slam it into the target. All the conventional Linux that make photons can also make electrons. You just take away this, this tungsten uh, screen at the end. Um, and they're useful, not so much in neuro. Um, most of what we do is uh, uh, x-rays. So remember, uh, an x-ray and a photon are all the same, it's the same terminology. A gamma ray is, is the same as a, uh, is also a photon, and it basically just means that the, it was created by the decay of a, a radioactive molecule. Okay, so an x-ray is something we create with a big tube. A gamma ray is something that the cobalt, when it decays, uh, creates. But they're essentially the same. They're, either way, they're a high energy photon. So you can see both of those, the yellow and the green lines, are, uh, show in tissue how a photon uh, will decay. The proton is unique. It, um, it, as you can see in the red, it basically goes along and it delivers about 20% of its energy along its path link. And then as it slows down, it drops all of its dose. And it has this thing called the Bragg peak. And it's a very narrow peak. And that's, that's useful when you want to treat something deep and spare things that are uh, superficial. It's important to remember, though, that there is that 20% when you're going in. So when you look at the pictures and you, you hear the ad, sometimes you think it has no dose. It's flying along just unscathed, and then it drops its dose. But it's a charged particle. It's going to interact with matter. It, it has a, a dose along the entire way. It's just when it starts to slow down and tumble, it will drop all of its dose. 
So just to make sure we're, um, where we're talking about here, we're talking about ionizing. Oops. Ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is way on the right there. We talked about gamma rays coming from radioactive decay, X-rays up here. There's all kinds of electromagnetic radiation around you. So cell phones, so obviously visible light is in the middle there. Uh, cell phones, radio waves are way on the left. These are all the same thing. They're all electromagnetic radiation. I just bring it up because you know people talk about the cell phones cause cancer. Cell phones are way over there. The energy is quite low. They're not ionizing radiation. What we're talking about here are, um, are x-rays. Does anyone want to guess what, what is the source of most, the highest source of ionizing radiation that you all get living just in normal environment? Cell phones? No, you weren't listening. <laughs> it's not ionizing. So cell phones, radio waves, way on the left. So to be ionizing, you have to be very high energy. You have to, what ionizing means is you actually can take that electron and knock it out of its orbit. So yeah, cosmic rays. So that's air travel. There's, yeah. It's actually really relevant. So here we're in Seattle. I grew up on the West Coast. I'm not exposed to it much. But actually, if you remember nothing from this talk, remember radon is a real deal. So um, this is what most people on average get. If you average out the number of people that get medical x-rays, et cetera, et cetera, over the average population, that's why you get 11% for medical x-rays, even though you and I are probably zero. Um, radon is about 55% of all the radiation that you guys uh, you get, depending on where you live in the world. Radon is, is, is serious, actually, because it's an alpha particle, and you inhale it. So it goes right to the lungs. It's close to a lot of important stuff. An alpha particle, remember, that's a helium nucleus. It's two um, uh, protons and two neutrons. It does a lot of damage. It's that high energy, high LET uh, radiation we were talking on that first slide that causes double strand breaks. Um, anyway, so. Remember that. Here we are up in the nice Northwest where we don't worry about it. But apparently other places in the country that I haven't lived, you actually have to drill holes in your basement and have, have air circulating and things like this to, to suck out radon. Um, how many cancer deaths do you think are caused in the US each year just from radon? I guess with the call on someone. Like actually, if you do the epidemiology and you figure out doses and you model it, 20,000 people a year are probably dying from radon alone, from lung cancer. Yeah. Um, all right, you can't get through a talk on radiation without talking about William Rankin. I don't know if uh, it's just us radiation oncology nerds that uh, read this stuff, so you may not know the story. But basically, in 1895, he was, people were experimenting with um, uh, electricity, and they were putting, they had vacuum tubes, they would suck out the air, they put various gases in, and they would put high voltage across it, essentially like neon lights. And you'd see colors and all this stuff, and they were studying it. So he was doing this, and he had a beryllium screen for some other project a couple meters away, and he noticed it at phosphorescent. And so there must have been some way that there was a particle or a charge or some energy was getting from there to there, and that's how he discovered x-rays. And then he started putting things in front of that to see what would happen. This is the famous picture of the very first x-ray, his wife and her wedding ring. It didn't take long before he got the Nobel Prize in 1901, the first Nobel Prize given. Then this guy, one year later, started figuring he could just aim it at people and treat cancer. And here's a nasal tumor that actually we still do this with called ortho voltage, very low voltage. Either you can use electrons, which we did like you know at first hill, or you can use a, a lower energy photon. So then we started aiming it at people, just figuring we could see what happens. And there's been the whole development since then. One of the challenges was uh, creating high enough energy. If you have very low energy. The important point here is the depth at the surface. You have a very high surface dose. So if you have a low energy x-ray, it's not going to penetrate very deep. Um, and then it creates skin erythema and all sorts of problems. Once you get to, so a third of its energy got dropped off within the first five centimeters. When you get to higher energy x-rays, you have skin sparing. And you can see that here where the dose goes up and then goes down. And that, that's very useful when all the things that we're treating in the common era, we need a high enough energy that we're not overdosing the skin. Um, this guy then, want, he was actually uh, interested in stereotactic surgery and, and ended up inventing stereotactic radio surgery. But initially, actually, he wasn't looking at radiation as the source. He was figuring out other electrodes or other ways to try and, try and uh, treat tumors. It wasn't until the later 50s that radiation became practical. What does stereotactic radiosurgery mean? So radiosurgery, of course, is, is kind of intuitive. It's this destruction of tissue 
uh, using radiation instead of a blade. So it's very conceptual. You're using extremely high doses of radiation. This is called ablative radiation, which is another term called saber, serotactic ablative radiation. Um, so uh, you're essentially just destroying anything within that zone that, where everything converges. Serotactic, which is, you guys are familiar with when your other techniques, really just means using a three-dimensional coordinate system in, in order to localize something. And not a word that's used much in the common uh, language, but I think it's, it, it's pretty, pretty intuitive for us. That is in, in uh, comparison to fractionated radiation, which is where, uh, where I was just talking about with the five and a half weeks. If you give a little bit of radiation each day, you allow normal tissues to recover, then that's fractionated radiation. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so the Gamma Knife, which we have downstairs, there's two in the city, one here, one at Harborview, essentially has a co cobalt sources, 192 sources. There's a metal collimator, so that the cobalt is always decaying. It gives off um, gamma rays that are about 1.25 MeV, so uh, mega electron volts, travels down the tube. There's a variable collimator where you can choose the size of the, or, uh, um, the orifice, and then it converges to a point. Here's one of the first gamma knives since 1968. Um, here's our more, our more modern, I think this is the 4C that we had at Northwest. Um, so basically it requires you to have a rigid mobilization and a frame that's screwed into the skull. Um, and it's given in a single fraction. Why is it given in a single fraction? Because no one would want to come back a second day and have the frame put on again. Okay, it's, it's, you know, it's arduous enough when people have a headache and they don't like it that that you only want to do that for one fraction. Here's just another picture kind of showing um, the, the conformality. Same thing here. So the benefits of the gamma knife is really the tight dose distribution, and you can't get this with any other kind of radiation. If you look, if you go five uh, millimeters off the central axis, you're already at uh, you know, 5%. At 2.5 millimeters off central axis, you're at 50%, and that's a very nice tight distribution. Uh, so why, why is gamma knife advantageous? You have a high number of beams. You have a wide degree of freedom on which beam. You can block any of those beams as well. You don't have to use all of them. As Ryder had mentioned, just as I walked in, when you're creating like the trigeminal neuralgia target, you can create a more oblong target by blocking some of the beams. It's extremely accurate because the patient's not moving. Every other kind of radiation around, the patient's moving. Even if you make a mask for the cyber knife, there's at least two to three millimeters of motion there. Because that, you don't have to, what the PTV is called, the planning target volume, it's how much we expand based on motion. You don't have to expand based on that at all. And then hypofractionation basically means you're giving extremely high doses in one fraction, giving a blade of radiation, and that is obviously uh, beneficial. Anyone recognize this person? Uh, Ron Young, and then on the left, Sandy, yeah, it's 25 years ago. I think it was a slide, that's why it's reversed. Um, so in terms of this versus fractionated radiation, so think about a cell culture plate where you have um, cells growing uh, on, on a monolayer on the bottom and you hit it with radiation. What you would expect is, you, again, with, with, fo with photon radiation, which is again called low LET, linear energy transfer radiation, where you have, quote, sparsely ionizing events. So along the DNA, you're getting different hits. You gotta have a double strand break to be lethal, right? So you have to have two events that happen in close proximity pretty darn close, within a few base pairs. So if you, if you figure, if you have a low dose of radiation, you've, you've modeled all it out, it should be an exponential curve. So when they did all this stuff, what they found was actually it wasn't quite an exponential curve. So this is a log scale on the left, linear on the bottom. So you would expect the line if it was an exponential death. But it doesn't. At low doses, it actually falls off and you have the shoulder. So it seems like cells can tolerate some degree of radiation and not die. Um, and it, it turns out later on that basically this is because of DNA re repair. You can basically have something called sublethal damage, where you damage um, again a one side, one one side of the DNA, not a double strand break, a single strand break. You can repair those events. There's DNA repair enzymes that shuttle up and down the DNA and do this. Um, so that's and so if you look at the, when we model this, we can model the shoulder versus the linear portion at higher doses. Okay, so. This is important because if you, if you use a, a, a source of radiation like a neutron that we're talking about or an alpha ray like radon, you don't have a shoulder because you're, creating, you're, you're basically creating a double strand break in the same portion of the DNA. 
So you're, you're shooting it, you're breaking the DNA, you don't really have that opportunity versus how you do with high energy photons. So on the left there, you can see this, this um, curve. You see the uh, neutrons and the alpha on the left uh, going straight down, and then you see the curve of the sparsely ionizing X-rays. We describe this with something called the alpha-beta ratio, which basically tells you how curvy the curve is. So uh, uh, lymphocytes, cancer cells, et cetera, tend to have high alpha-beta ratios. Normal tissue has a lower alpha-beta ratio. And this describes basically the sublethal damage repair that's happening. So when you use a linear accelerator, you're basically operating in that curvy zone. You, you're, when you use gamma knife, you're in a very, very high dose where everything dies. Anything, a gamma knife's very simple in terms of concept. Anything inside that cone of death is gonna die, whether it's normal or tumor. But with fractionated radiation that you use, let's say if you're fractionating a GBM, you are operating in that shoulder region. And what that means is the normal brain tissue can survive two gray a day, repair with a sublethal damage repair to the next day, hit it again, hit it again, hit it again, until a certain point, and that's you know, around 60 gray. Um, versus the tumor cells actually die relatively uh, religiously each day, a certain percent dies. And that's because of difference in the alpha beta. So what you're doing essentially by fractionating is you're repeating that um, that shoulder over and over and over every day to create a less steep survival curve. For the uh, normal cells, the tumor cells have lost the DNA repair genes because when they've, in the process of, of growing and mutating and growing quickly, they've thrown them out. They've thrown, a, a, they've favored genes that favor fast growth, and a lot of times they've thrown out those genes because they're just not necessary. And this is anecdotal, obviously. We knew radiation worked before they knew why, but when you look at it now, you can see that they've lost a lot of DNA repair genes and they have a lot of mutations. And cut is that, does that make any sense? A little bit, okay. So fractionated radiation, you're operating in that shoulder region. So tumor cells aren't that sensitive to fractionation compared to uh, normal cells. Their alpha beta is high, their shoulder is small, they die readily with radiation because they don't repair sublethal damage, as long as you're operating in that shoulder region. If you give too low of a dose, uh, nothing happens. If you give too high of a dose, everything dies. So you have to use that. Uh, that's why the daily radiation is always around 1.8 to 2 gray. Um, so then once that was sort of figured out, it didn't take long to make radiation machines that were giving fractionated radiation in the 50s. And then they've, and they would give, do something like this, where you'd have four beams. Here's a prostate in the middle. And essentially, the point here is that you don't really have to be that conformal. You're treating the entire area. You're treating half the rectum, treating part of the bladder. But those tissues aren't dividing cells, so they don't really uh, die from radiation. They're not happy about it. You get proctitis. You get inflammation. You get skin erythema. You, you get diarrhea because absorption doesn't work. But the cell doesn't truly die. It will, it will survive once you recover after a month. But the tumor cells truly do die. They accumulate those double strand breaks, and then you can actually have you know, complete cure rates using a field like this. And which is, again, very different than what we're doing with, um, with uh, gamma knife, but it's actually not that different from what we're doing with glioblastoma, where you're treating two centimeters around. Typically, when we treat a GBM, we expand the tumor volume that we see on T1 by about two centimeters. And then we give some dose to the edema, there's, presuming there's tumor cells in the edema. So there's a lot of normal tissue in there. Um, the new Linux are essentially very similar to that. They're just a lot fancier. They have onboard imaging, which is the panels there. They've got uh, sensors up here that they can, you can put LEDs on a chest so you can watch someone's breathing and you can gate. You can turn it on and off when someone's breathing in and out. They have a table, which is called a couch, that can move in all sorts of different directions. But it's essentially the same idea. You're treating an entire field. We can be more conformal now. So you can now you can spare, let's say, a critical structure like the optic chiasm or the rectum by, by using multiple beams. So that was sort of the state of radiation when I was a resident, at least, which wasn't all that long ago. You had a blade of radiation with gamma knife, and you had fractionated big field radiation. And then along came um, this guy, John Adler, and he basically said, wouldn't it be cool if I could make, uh, invent something that looked like this, so I didn't have to do this every morning at 7 o'clock. And also, the, the gamma knife is limited to the brain because you know, the way that that helmet is, you really can't get, you can treat C1, but you can't get much further than that. But if you were to develop something with a robotic arm like that, uh, then you could, instead of having on the left, you have, you see us in the morning with the frame on clicked into the machine, you could just see these guys come in, in the middle of the day, get your treatment, come in and walk off, pretty easy. Plus, you would have the advantage of being able to treat the spine and other areas. 
So that so this is the cyber knife as opposed to the gamma knife, and there's <coughs> one in the city of Seattle, and it's downstairs <coughs> on A level. And what it is essentially is a robotic arm. How am I on time? Ten minutes. Okay, good. Uh oh. Um, it's a robotic arm. It's the same robot that's used on the assembly line of the, uh, the Tesla factory, the BMW factory. It's an industrial robot made by a company called Coca, and it's very accurate and it's a very hardworking robot. You've seen the videos where it's flying around on the assembly line. We don't, ours goes a lot slower. That would, that would freak people out. But, uh, but it's still pretty darn, I mean, it can go for years and years and years. Uh, so the, the first technology was basically being able to miniaturize the linear accelerator to the point where it was around 350 pounds and it could be on the head of this machine because the old other Linux you saw are, are just too big. The second was really a lot of software where there are image detectors in the floor, there are cameras up top, and in real time it will image as the patient's being treated. And you can see, for example, here, here's a spine treatment. It's a little hard to see, but there's a basis skull on the left, and this is the C-spine. Um, so it will real-time image this patient, and if the patient is moving, you, you, you mobilize as best as you can with a mass, but even within that range, if there's slight motions, either roll, pitch, or any kind of translation, it will correct for that real-time. So this allows us to essentially treat a lot more than just the brain. You can use CyberKnife to treat brain tumors, especially if you want to fractionate, as we were talking about, because again, you don't want to put a frame on every day. You can do this. So this opened up a lot of options for brain. A lot of most institutions have one or the other. They don't have both, but we have since we had such a high volume, we have both, and we use a CyberKnife for uh, more spine tumors, and we use a Gamma Knife for more of our, our brain tumors, with, with those exceptions. So essentially, the, the software development was essentially having image recognition cameras, not on like a self-driving car where it recognizes, okay, this is, this is L5, and we can just tell it this is L5, and it models L5 in three dimensions on our planning when we do the simulation. When it sees the patient at different angles, it understands what that is, and it understands how to move. It's not perfect. There's a little bit of lag time, and this is why for things like tremor, I wouldn't do it. I would use the Gamma Knife. You want to have truly no motion at all for tremor. For trigeminal neuralgia, we've chosen to use the Gamma Knife for the same reason. The people around the country do treat with, with CyberKnife on TN because you have a little bit more room, but, but we tend to uh, want to be as precise as possible. This just shows kind of the, the role and the pitch and, and, and yaw corrections that are done on any individual case real time. Once we uh, realized that you could uh, track, the, it kind of opened up a whole field that's, again, not as much relevant to CNS, but we could put gold markers anywhere in the body, and we can, uh, we can essentially treat prostate cancer, lung cancer, liver tumors, et cetera. Um, well, what about the whole fractionation business? Well, as it turns out, as the technology's gotten better and better, we've realized that we really don't need six weeks of radiation for breast cancer. We still do six and a half weeks of radiation for GBMs, but in some cases, you can actually shorten the time frame. For prostate cancer, as it turns out, the alpha beta prostate is probably pretty low. It's somewhere maybe around two instead of like a lymphoma would be 10 or even breast cancer is probably close to 10. Uh, there isn't much difference with fractionation. So, it, it turns out you can actually, if you can be conformal enough, you can probably just treat in a more ablative gamma knife-like way for a tumor like that. And so we actually have been treating prostate cancer with five fractions. We have a, a national trial, a 21 institution a clinical trial that's been open for um, about nine years. And uh, we just published a five-year data and it's, it's very good. Obviously for lung cancer, it works great because you can track those gold markers as someone's breathing and you can spare a normal lung. Otherwise, essentially you're treating the entire excursion of where a tumor would move. <clears throat> and here is treating a liver tumor, same thing. Especially around the diaphragm, there's a lot of motion and so we can track that and we can treat with an ablative dose. Um, let's talk about protons for a few minutes because this comes up a lot and I'm sure it's gonna come up for the fellows. Uh, and it comes up at our tumor boards a lot. So, so when do you want to use protons? Well, to, to keep it simple, divide the protons into two, uh, um, two reasons. One is sparing normal tissues, and the other is reducing scatter. So remember we looked at that curve, the proton goes along, giving 20, 30% of its dose, and then it drops off from the Bragg peak. So there are times when that would be useful. Let's say you're treating inocular melanoma. You want to treat the tumor itself. You don't want to treat the whole brain necessarily. Um, if you're treating craniospinal radiation, I think that's one of the clearest uh, benefits because you can enter with a posterior beam alone and you don't have all the uh, exit through the small bowel, colon, et cetera. 
uh, chordoma. Uh, there's some evidence on, on that as well. And then I think we talked about this last tumor board, you know, pineal tumors, uh, very central tumors like that. Uh, ependymoma, it actually does a little better job sparing the cochlea. Also, in some tumors, you can spare the hippocampus if you're trying to treat um, you know, midline structures. Essentially, when you want to stop a beam, when you don't want to have dose scatter. <clears throat> and the second reason would be reducing that low-dose scatter. In the adult, it's not that important. We all get low-dose scatter. It's not really clinically significant. In children, they have more years to live. They're also more sensitive, not just per year. If you look at the second malignancy rate of a 20-year-old and you look at a 40-year-old, it's incredibly higher at 15 years for the 20-year-old. For some reason, our DNA is more fragile when we're younger, and that ends up uh, not being the case when you get to be over 40. Stanford looked at the Hodgkin's patients versus breast cancer, and age over 30 was significantly less. Is it that it's more sensitive because it's intrinsic to the DNA or just because kids are growing and cells around the body? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't know. My, my, my uh, recollection was it was felt to be some sort of epigenetic you know, factor in the DNA, but it, it, it could be because, I, you know, you see it in 18-year-olds, but, yeah, I don't know. Um, also, some people that have genetic syndromes, you'd want to reduce low-dose scatter. NF1, RB, things like that, leave for money. <clears throat> so recall that this is the, um, the proton depth dose curve. Here's an example. So here's the ocular tumor. Uh, with protons, it's a huge machine. It's a huge gantry. You're not going to come in with 192 beams like you do with a gamma knife. You come in with two or three. And the QA for each beam is incredibly arduous, and their physicists working all night there. And so here's just using two beams treating an ocular tumor. And you can see, uh, compared on the right side, this would be IMRT, what we would do. And you can see the low dose scatter to the brain is obviously a lot, a lot better. But uh, keep in mind, the dose drop off directly around that tumor is still not great. You're talking about sp sparing more distant. Like with medullo, you're sparing the small bowel. But you're not going to sculpt it around a vertebral body and spare you know, spinal cord or something like that. So in, in contrast, when we do something like cyber, we can come in with 300 beams, and often we can create a, a tighter dose distribution in the, in the smaller area. So I think, um, so the other thing is that proton Bragg peak is so sharp that in practicality, you can't really target a tumor. You'll either stop, you, you will miss. So what they have to do is they have to broaden out the Bragg peak. And the way you do it is you actually create a lucite block and you spin it in front of the proton beam. And, it had, and the block is carved for every patient of a different thickness. And it's kind of a beam spoiler. So if you didn't have the block, you get the Bragg peak there. If you have a block of a certain thickness, you'll have the Bragg peak scoot over and you create the width that you want to treat by spinning this lucite. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty labor intensive, but you end up spoiling your Bragg peak in some case anyways, and you have to treat in some capacity deep and superficial to the tumor because you don't have any other kind of imaging or tracking during the treatment. You set the patient up at the beginning of the treatment, treatment takes half an hour, you don't exactly know what's happening. Uh, again, for CNS tumors, people aren't really moving, but for other tumors like breast or whatever, it's, it's, you don't have a, a real-time tracking. Um, but still, if you look at, for example, on the right, that's a proton plan versus on the left, photon plan, there's no dose going to the posterior fossa, there's um, no dose going to the posterior neck. You could spare the cord in a case like that. This is a head and neck case. There's no reason we really need to be treating the cord, so we could spare it. Um, but, uh, but also keep in mind, looking around the area of interest that's being treated, there's still a lot of spillover dose. There's entrance dose, and there's still a lot of dose in the, in, in the anterior structure. Here's, like, for example, a cyber case that we, we of one of ours. And uh, again, you can see if you have the chiasm and brainstem, you have a very fast dose drop off. Looking at the entire image, you wouldn't get that with protons. Or something like this with the gamma, where you can go from 16 gray down to 8 gray in you know, 5 millimeters. And 8 gray really does no damage, not even optic structures, versus 16 gray being lethal for meningioma or small tumor or brain mat. Um, this is just what a proton therapy machine looks like. They're big and they're very, um, uh, they require a lot of QA and they're very expensive. I think that's probably, I have just a couple of quick slides on neutrons and then we'll be done. Um, 
you can pretty much forget about neutrons for, for, for boards and things like that. There are three centers in the US that operate. Seattle happens to be one of them, so maybe because you're from Seattle, you'll be popular. It operates at the University of Washington. This, when protons came out, it kind of really replaced it, so a lot of, a lot of people lost interest in neutrons. But again, the idea is it's a high linear energy transfer. It deposits a lot of energies at part, as it traverses across the beam. It's very hard to make. You have to have an accelerator. Um, and um, it favors that direct effect over the indirect effect. The, the, um, the hope was that it really would get around tumor hypoxia, again, because it's not using the free radicals of oxygen. It's directly damaging the DNA. Since a lot of tumors were hypoxic, there was a thought that maybe that's why we're seeing radio resistance. Um, it really only has worked out for salivary gland tumors and adenoid cystic carcinoma. There was a lot of hope that it would work with gliomas but it didn't really ever uh, have a positive trial. There's a couple of positive trials with adenoid cystic and salivary tumors. It's actually a little complicated because you, 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 you see more side effects, and so the thought was maybe they're just treating to a higher dose. But when you kind of do the calcs and stuff, you think probably, probably there's maybe a slight benefit. But we send people over to the proto neutron center for that. Um, and this is useful, again, where you have low alpha beta tumors, i.e. the tumor uh, is not, it's not really going to have uh, much of a shoulder. The last thing I'm just going to mention, since Sandy talks about it a lot these days, is boron neutron capture. Just this is just something you might just hear. Uh, it's 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 basically a different kind of neutron. It's a slow, not a fast neutron. It's called an epithermal neutron. It's a low energy neutron that doesn't really cause any damage when you're exposed to it normally. And what you do is you inject this magical compound where you have. A, uh, uh, boron 10 conjugated to it, and you inject it, and it only goes to tumor cells, and it doesn't go to your normal cells. And I think I heard a talk about this in like 1986, and I don't think the talk has changed much, but I've heard it <laughs> pitched by a few private companies, and there's one that's come talk to us. But basically, if you had a perfect compound that only uh, went into tumors, then you can just put the patient in front of this neutron source, and it would, and, and where the neutron hit the boron 10, it would create boron 11 and an alpha particle, which we were saying is very damaging. Remember the alpha particle to uh, neutrons, to protons, very damaging. You get death of tumor cells, and it's extremely conformal. Um, I, I, I think the problem is making the drug, and I know there are companies working on it, but there's a big company down in California that's an energy company that's working on nuclear uh, uh, fusion. And as a, a product of that technology, they basically miniaturize the neutron source. And so there's a, a medical offshoot of that. Um, and actually, I think where that stands now, it's actually well tolerated. It's safe. It, it's been studied in Japan, Finland, everywhere else. It's ideal for something like a recurrent GBM. But so far, it seems to work about the same as standard radiation. It doesn't seem to have an advantage. But it is. It has been. It has been treated. You know, people have been treated with this. And there are centers, you know, nationally that are still or internationally that are still open, not in the U.S. I think that's probably a good place to stop. That's where we're at, we're at eight o'clock now. Yeah. I, I have more clinical stuff we can do. I we want to do a part two another another month. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. That was a great introduction. Thank you. Sure.